So I invited the uh, Kenya team here to essentially share with us a couple of aspects of what it means to be salt and, and essentially serve as, as a significant illustration for a point that I'm going to make in just a moment. But I wanted, first of all, Nancy to take just a minute, and they're just going to share a couple of minutes each, but just to take a moment to uh, describe why and what we're there, what we do there in Kenya so that you know what's going on. Uh, in 2006, I was introduced to the Reverends Stella and Daniel Witte. They were here in Fort Worth uh, so that uh, Stella could spend a year of pastoral clinical education at Harris Hospital. And uh, little did I know that those, that couple would become a member of my family for 2006 when I first met them. And little did I know that it would end up leading to four trips to Kenya. Uh, the first trip to Kenya was very much an exploratory trip where we tried to find out the best thing that we could do on their behalf. Uh, between Stella and Daniel at the time that we got started on that trip, they served 27 different local churches between the two of them. Um, as most of you know, Sub-Saharan Africa has just been devastated by the AIDS virus. There are literally millions of children who have been orphaned because of the virus. And what we determined on that trip was that providing educational support to the AIDS orphans and vulnerable children would be the best thing that we could do for them. And Stella and Daniel selected 250 kids that are uh, probably some of the saddest cases that they knew of in their community. And today we continue to support these kids. Those are the faces of the children that you're looking at. Uh, the primary school students, uh, we provide school uniforms to them because they can't go to school without a uniform. So these kids would not be getting an education if we were not providing them with a school uniform. And then the secondary children, they only go to secondary school if they pass an exam and make high enough scores to go on to secondary school. That uh, would start in the ninth grade for them. And we provide tuition and school uniforms for the kids that are in secondary school. Um, little did I know when I met that couple the uh, unexpected ways uh, that they have enhanced and changed my life. Thank you. One of the things that, uh, that came to mind as we were talking, I was talking primarily with, with uh, Emily and Tim uh, last week and as we were talking about uh, how to approach this, Nancy and I as, as well as uh, Melinda Smoot here with the communications pro uh, department or ministry here at First Methodist, things we've been thinking about in, in the stories of our life as a church, oftentimes we think of the informa informative part of it, the information, the what happens. But there's also, if you just start talking and you start listening to the stories, there's also something that happens to the person involved. It's as if you set out intentionally to be something. It's as if you set out intentionally to be the Beatitudes, to put them into your life and you're just simply living humbly, mournfully, peacemaking oriented. It's as if your life is oriented on a why and then something totally unexpected happens. You're just doing what you went out to do. And in the process, you experience something completely unexpected. So I've asked them to share just a couple of moments for each of them, what ha how that happened. Um, well, for me, um, you know, you go over there and, of, of course, life is completely different. But there are so many similarities. And in some of these pictures, you see kids being kids, right? Kids all over the place are just kids. Um, but... Nancy Fisher and I had the opportunity to sit down with a group, 20 or so, of the secondary students, so high school students, and we asked them, you know, what do you do for fun? What's fun? And they all kind of looked at each other and looked back at us and said, we have fun at church. It's, it's a time to dance. It's a time for fellowship. It's a time for praising. It's a time to see our friends and to be mindful. And something unexpected happened in me and coming home, I'm so much more mindful of things. I'm conscious of the fact that this glass of water that I get at, at lunch, I might not finish all of it, but I'm so grateful to have that glass of water. So I think that's something, and it changes in me every single day. There's something that I, I'm like, I'm, I'm thankful that I woke up with a roof over my head and a warm blanket. 
Um, for me, I am a teacher. Uh, I'm not currently teaching in the school system right now um, because of the school that where my children go. I teach them part-time at home, and then they go to school the other part of the time. But I taught in a public high school. I taught in a private school. Um, and now I guess I'm kind of partially homeschooling. So I've seen all aspects of education until I went to Africa, until I went to Kenya. And, um, you know, the verse in the Bible that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, for me, um, education is that. Um, and if for nothing else, it gives options. You know, it's hard to get wrapped up, especially in the U.S., in our system and the problems and as a teacher in a public high school, the apathy of the kids, and it's hard to believe in education sometimes here in the States. But when you go there, it is pervasive. The value of education, it is palpable in that country. And I am so, so proud that our church is part of educating um, a small handful of those children over there because because of us, because of our efforts in this church, they will have options. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll tell you, this is my second trip to Kenya. Um, we went, Kim and I went uh, last year, and you know, I was looking at all the kids and interacting with all the kids, and you know, at the end, you know, we all sort of got together and we gave. Uh, these backpacks to the kids as a gift and we all kind of sat in a stage and then one by one each of us you know handed backpacks and we named each uh, child by name the thing that really um, was really moving to me and and certainly made me ask a lot of questions about my life is why am I up there sitting on the stage giving things to the kids and why are they over there these kids are wonderful they're smart they're bright and I always ask myself why am I here I was did not make a choice to be here I was born into this you know wonderful country of ours with all the wonderful things that we have and the comforts that we have in living um, at the end of the day those kids taught me more about faith and more about believing and more about perseverance um, than anybody I've seen um, in my entire life. Uh, they taught me how to be thankful for what I have and what we have, and they taught me more than I can ever teach them. morning. The trip to Kenya this year was really remarkable. And in fact, I've, I've been on two other mission trips that are all, they're all life changing in such different ways. But I have to agree with Sereni. What I noticed is how I would hope that I have matured in my Christianity over these many, many years of being in church. But to be able to see these young people who demonstrate and live their faith each and every day, who truly say and mean it, how thankful and blessed they are. They would not think about starting their day without a morning prayer. They do not think about taking a break without ending it with a prayer or ending their day with prayer. So their communication with our Heavenly Father is an ongoing dialogue that they have. And I hope that I can learn to be as mature in my faith as I saw demonstrated by five, seven, 10 and 15 year old kids. They taught me a lot. Um, we were talking about the unexpected when we find the unexpected. Um, and I haven't talked about this before. Uh, the last year, last year when we were here uh, in Kenya, there was a woman who has been a pivotal part of the entire program and her name's Mercy. And she teaches the younger children. And at, um, I'm going to try to keep it really short. One Sunday while we were gone, Mercy preaches in her local church and speaks. And the Sunday that she was supposed to preach, she had received a phone call. Now, granted, she lives maybe 10 miles from where she preaches and walks. 
and uh, received a phone call that said, your, your house is on fire. Your house is really on, I mean, it's, it's gonna burn down. And she was talking to us about it, and she said, I thought, I thought what can I do? You know, with, uh, I'm miles away. Even if I run back home, my house will still be gone. And she hung up the phone, and she went to the podium, and she preached about thankfulness and about appreciation. Um, I had called Emily, and I talked to her about this, and we agreed to just give her a small amount of money to try and help out building her house uh, back and to try and get a roof over her heads. And it wasn't $20 or anything, but it, to a white middle-class American family, this was you know, the equivalent of maybe a Christmas present or something like that. And the unexpected thing was that I thought that it was more like a Band-Aid on a wound. Here's something to help you out with, you know, I'm sorry for your troubles and something like that. What I found out the next year completely changed my outlook. The money that we had given her, she had used to not only start up her own storefront, not only fix up her house, but during the course of that next year, a child came to her door who was an orphan child, and granted she has four children, she has uh, a house that she's rebuilding, she is bare minimum, but she said, when I saw that child, the child was hungry, covered in lice, no real clothes to, to, to hold on to, nothing to hold, nothing tangible to hold on to, and I thought, these people gave me a gift, I should be able to reciprocate and give them a gift. She took in an orphan child. So because of that small gift, instead of putting a Band-Aid on a wound, what we did was we planted a seed. And I think that's what our entire mission statement is when we go there, we plant this seed and we teach these children the value of, of education, of generosity, of love, and of a universal love that knows no borders and no ethnicity. And they reciprocate that to everyone else in their community. And so we really don't just affect these 250 children, we affect everyone around us and we're affected by it more than any words can, can describe. My unexpected was also mercy, but not the mercy Tim talks about. Um, my mercy was a little girl with a shaved head. She had a green smock on for a dress little Buck Keith, and I noticed her all the time being by herself, and I guess sometimes what we relate to the most is what we experience in our own life, and so I could relate to that little girl sitting over there all by herself, and my unexpected was this little girl allowed me to come into her life. She let me play with her. She let me color with her, and I think, you know, we look overwhelming at 250 children, but they're really individuals. And that, to me, is what this is all about, is relationship. And just to have that one relationship with that one little girl was amazing. And we get to have those relationships with 250 children. And so it's amazing, and it's amazing that I feel like y'all are all part of this. It's not just us going. It's if you have prayed for us, if you've thought about this, if you gave any money, if you bought um, any of our school supplies. Um, if you just knew we were going, we're all a part of this. And to me, that was also something unexpected that I learned. It's not just us. It's all of us. Well, I, I um, wanted very quickly, too, Emily, would you mention, uh, you mentioned something about the, the tea, the, the tea is, they celebrate tea every day, right? Yes, they have a they, tea. Yes, um, we're ruled by the British until 1964, I believe. And so they really carry a lot of um, British traditions, one of them being tea time. They have tea time two times a day, um, 10 and then about 3 in the afternoon. And um, as Tim was mentioning our story with um, Mercy, Mercy, with some of that money that we gave her, bought her and her family a tea set, a teapot and teacups. And inside the lid of her teapot are the names... <laughs> Tim, Emily, and Molly. And she said every time they sit down and have tea, they pray for us and our family. And not just our family, but the whole church family. This is the power, guys. It's pretty incredible. When I was working with the Texas Youth Academy at Georgetown in Southwestern University, I called up Nancy and I said one of the things we wanted to do with this group of youth, these were teenagers from all over the Texas, Texas and North Texas conferences, and uh, we wanted to have a moment where we celebrated sort of a global worship. Um, we had different people there sharing. And I as asked Nancy as well as um, Chuck, where's Jeff? Uh, Chuck also leads a group to Costa Rica. 
and, and uh, Jeff has gone with them many times now, as well as a couple of other folks here, to that mission. And I asked them if they would contact uh, those folks and discovered that in the process, because we wanted them to pray uh, for us uh, in, at the Texas Youth Academy, but we discovered in the process that already that group prays for the people of First United Methodist every week, if not more often than that. It's just an amazing thing to know somewhere around the world are, we're connected in ways we, we just have no idea. 